Hello, hello, hello. Let me make sure my new microphone is working, huh? Hopefully I sound a little better than I normally do. How's it sound? Can you hear me? I can hear me. Everybody let me know how the sound is. We are working with a whole new setup right now. Here, I can actually show you. So this is what happens when your parents get you a new mic for Christmas. Oh, y'all can hear me? Sweet. Thank you. But you're you're too poor to buy a mic stand. I don't know if y'all can tell, but my mic right now is held up by duct tape. So I had a mic stand for my um, less valuable, less expensive mic. Um, so I just put the new mic in it and then duct taped it down. <laughs> and then there's the little sound box. My parents accidentally got me an XLR microphone, which is once you get to the high end microphones, you eventually have to get an XLR which means you need like a sound box. Um, it doesn't just plug directly into your computer. Oh, my hair is crazy. Um, it doesn't just plug directly into your computer by USB. So I had to wait for that sound box, and now I'm working on getting a mic stand. But that's where we're at with that. Sounds great to me. Real proletarian set up there. Damn right. We don't need that expensive crap. <clears throat> Please post this because I won't be able to watch all. Um, for sure, all of the lives and as well as all of the... Um, shoot, I need to set up my second screen here. All of the YouTube and Twitch lives are saved um, to both our YouTube and our Twitch. Um, and that's automatically... One sec. I'll show you here in a sec after I get my screen set up. Um, what the hell? Why did that come up? <laughs> Sorry, I'll show you here so you can see what I'm talking about. So if I go to YouTube. Uh, Midwestern Marks. Right here on the, it says live. Right next to shorts. You can see all of our lives here. I need to add some thumbnails for a few of these. So yeah, all of them are uploaded forever. Hey, Eddie. hello, Papa Squats, how are you? Hey, comrade, yeah, we can hear. Good, New York commie, how you doing? How you doing, Chungus? Hello, comrade, Eddie, hello, Jacob. Um, hey, Eddie, have you seen Citizen Coke? I couldn't even get through the whole thing because it was so crummy to watch as a Wisconsinite. Oh, man. No, I haven't seen it. What's it about? Is it about Act 10? Because the Coke brothers dumped so much money into Act 10. If you read Jane Meyer's book, Dark Money, which is about the like how the Coke brothers basically funneled money um, into the university systems um, and funneled money to do into political organizing, right-wing Republican Tea Party political organizing. Um, Scott Walker was like their favorite politician they ever had, the governor of Wisconsin who cut the teachers' unions um, and their pay. He was like the, the favorite of the Koch brothers. They're like, this guy doesn't have a mind of his own. He'll just do whatever we, whatever we tell him. Um, so he was the one who dismantled uh, like I said, collective bargaining for teachers in Wisconsin. And um, for my Journal of American Socialist Studies 2 article, I was doing some research and well, actually just for my health administration program. But um, he also dismantled Medicaid at that time, dismantled Badger Care, not dismantled, that it's still decent, but um, made it less good than it had been for years and years. Oh, it's about Citizens United. Got you. Oh, this is from like 2013 or 14. So this was a while back. Hmm. Maybe I'll check that one out. Wondering what the accomplishments of Kim Il-sung were. Hard to 
um, find unbiased sources. Yeah, check out the Liberation School. Um, I think they're a arm of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, actually, in this podcast, which I should have cut this into clips, I probably still should make highlights of this podcast. Um, but Derek Ford of the Liberation School, who's been to both North and South Korea and spent a lot of time there, um, speaks specifically about the accomplishments of Kim Il-sung and how the U.S. and their allies had regiments or battalions uh, specifically assigned with capturing Kim Il-sung because he was such an effective fighter and organizer. You know, they were willing to put entire battalions on him. Hey, Eddie, just recently finished Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds. I'm proud of myself. Good job, Jacob. We're proud of you. Um, I've got two Marxist analytical books under my belt. First, Angela Davis's Woman, Race, and Class. I'm now reading Lenin, State, and Revolution, but I'm waiting for a new copy. The edition I have sucks because it doesn't have an actual preface. Gotcha. I hope you know that we have that. That's very cool. Congrats on finishing your first books. Um, getting some under your belt. Uh, let's see here. I did a full, a full ass breakdown, a full playlist of state and revolution, summarizing it, breaking down, like talking about how every point that Lenin makes is relevant in modern day or not relevant, how things have changed since then. So I just threw that in the chat for you. Um, it's these vid videos right here, state and revolution. Um, this playlist is kind of unorganized. I should reorganize that. But only so much time in the world, comrades. Ordered a copy of Lenin's Imperialism without realizing it had a Trotskyite preface. Yeah, that's a lot of books. Like Carlos and I were saying the other day, like if you get a copy of Capital or the Grundrisse, not the Grundrisse actually, the Grundrisse is different, um, which is why we were talking about this. But if you get a copy of Capital um, from Penguin, which is like the main most well-known publisher, um, it's going to have a preface from a Trotskyite talking about how existing socialism is bad and evil. Um, it's just the, the nature of publishing stuff like that in, in America today. Like, you know, before you talk about Marxism, you got to be like, oh, you know, I like Marxism, but, you know, not in real life. In real life, it's, you know, always been bad. And um, I like to talk about Marxism, but people who applied Marxism. Eh. Uh, oh, I had another joke I was going to make about that, but um, I can't remember. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a joke that says, you know, every person online who tries to teach you Marx or every person in a book who tries to teach you Marx has to start off with like a 30 minute lecture about how you might accidentally kill and starve a million people to death by reading Marx. You know, <laughs> like this stuff is good and it makes a lot of sense and it really helps explain capitalism. Um, but if you try and create a different system than capitalism, you're going to starve a million people to death and be the most evil, horrible person ever, ever, ever. Stalin, Stalin, Stalin. <laughs> Just got Che by John Lee Anderson. Nice. I love that book. Um, I really love Che. Um, right now, one of my friends has it. I loaned that book to him. Hopefully I get it back. Is this live? Yeah, yeah, this is live. Um, I never, that's why I re never read prefaces. Always want to know what the author is saying, not some weirdo. Yeah. But Marx and Ingalls did a lot of prefaces like for each other, um, or prefaces to their own book, like new introductions talking about what's changed. Those, those are worth reading for sure. And I like to read the prefaces too. Right now I'm reading the Grundrisse and I'm making my way through the preface. Once you understand basically historical and dialectical materialism, once you have a basic grasp on it, um, it becomes interesting to read like Trotskyites and people who disagree with you, people who also, you know, support Marxism and dialectical materialism, but have a different perspective on it. Um, it's interesting to read and compare to where you're at. So. Is the Che movie based on the book? I don't know. There's a handful of Che movies and books. 
I'm currently reading Inventing Reality, and it made my jaw literally drop more than once. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that um, it's a great text. Carlos yesterday was working on maybe setting something up um, to where Midwestern Marx could publish like old classical works of Marxism. Like we, he was saying just the regular books without writing an introduction. Um, cause we could have someone print them for us and then sell them. Uh, but if you're going to do that on Amazon, you need to at least write an original introduction to the book. And I'm like, I know it would be extra work and extra time that we don't have, but, um, we should just start writing introductions for some of these classical works and then putting them up for sale for people so they can get books that they're going to buy anyways and also support us. Have you always been a big reader? I started out as a Marxist at 12 years of age. I didn't start reading until 15. Um, yeah, I kind of like I've always been good at reading and I've always loved reading. And when I would like put down the video games and actually start reading, um, I wouldn't stop. Right. I would just be that kid who just couldn't stop. Couldn't put the book down because um, I loved learning. But I was also in wrestling and working really, really hard at wrestling from a pretty young age. Um, so, like, my friends almost, like, bullied me out of being smart. You know, not really even my wrestling friends, but the friends at school, like the athletes, the jocks, you know, they were insecure about not being smart themselves. So they would bully and make fun of other people who were smart. So forever I had this block in my head, like, no. You know, being smart and reading is stupid. I should just play video games and do sports and not care about school. Otherwise, it'll be stupid. Um, so I didn't start caring about school and really reading like a madman until um, I was a sophomore in college, which was like five, six years ago now. Um, and I haven't looked back since to the point where now, you know, I don't even get, I would love to read a lot more than I get to, you know, I'd love to sit down and read the Grundrisse today, but I wanted to plan a stream and do a stream. And I had to finish my article for the Journal of American Socialist Studies. And then I have practice at four. So dope new frames. Looks good, comrade. Thank you. Shout out to my parents. Thoughts on Chomsky on anarchism introduced me to the left, but I'm currently reading Capital. Oh, awesome. I love it. Um, you're going to love Capital. That's why I love Chomsky. You know, Chomsky is a gateway. He's like a pipeline to Parenti and Marxism and being a tanky. And like Chomsky's arguments against Leninism and against existing socialism are so bad. <laughs> They're so bad and like half-assed that it's easy for people who like Chomsky to make the jump to like Parenti or make the jump to like Vijay Prashad. Because they confirm most of what Chomsky says about U.S. imperialism, Western imperialism. You know, he says that every if the Nuremberg trials were upheld, every post-World War II president would be in the hag or would be in prison. Um, so he's he lambasts the Western capitalist empire. Uh, but, you know, anytime existing socialism comes up, he's like, no, it's all bad and evil and they haven't achieved anything. But, you know, that's all he really says. There's like a one minute video of him on YouTube talking about Leninism. It's like, yeah, you can debunk everything Lenin ever wrote in a minute. <laughs> and because you can't, you know, it's easy for a lot of Chomsky people, like I said, to make that jump. They're like, oh, Chomsky was right about 90 percent of stuff, but he was wrong about existing socialism, which is why he never really talks about it. And even now that Chomsky's like 101 years old, he's moving more towards um, being a tanky. He is. I, I just got a book, um, his book with Vijay Prashad. Uh, one sec here. Also, let me plug my lights in. You can barely see them right now. It's light out. But So I just got this book from our comrade Debbie. Shout out Debbie. Um, called The Withdrawal. Um, which is Vijay Prashad and Chomsky talking about Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the fragility of U.S. power, forwarded by Angela Davis. So you never stop learning, folks. Never stop learning. This man Parenti, I mean, this man Chomsky is still learning at like the age of 100. I've tried to find what tanky means, but what's a tanky other than a bad voosh insult? 
Um, there's a good actually Vijay Prashad actually has a good video where he talks about where the term tanky originated with like um a few Soviet invasions, like the invasion of Hungary, which was to stop literal fascism from taking power. Um, which is interesting that people get called tankies, right? Actually, let's just watch the video. Let's just watch that video right now. I didn't have this on the stream plan today, but this is a good video to watch. And look at that. When you search Vijay Prashad tanky, you get this and you get Midwestern marks. So I guess we've already watched this one before, but... BJ, so the first question that I have for you is a burning question that's on everyone's mind. What is a tanky? <laughs> oh, well, I see. What is a tanky? Um, it's great to be with you. This is one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, it's not a tanky podcast. Uh, I don't even know <laughs> really why we would play with the term. The term has a funny origin. And I actually hadn't heard this term in many, many years. It made a a return just a few years ago, I think, um, when a certain section of, um, particularly in the West, a certain section of social media opinion started to attack people who seemed to be in favor of uh, the Cuban revolution, uh, the Bolivarian revolution, Venezuela, people who were with Evo Morales at the time when the coup was happening, people like that, that is to say people like you and I, uh, began to be called tankies. This is a term that comes from 1956, certainly before you were born, and yes, even before I was born. Uh I saw somebody today in some Instagram comments saying, the craziest thing about the war in Ukraine is how it's united the far right and the tankies. <laughs> I'm like, that's one way to look at it. Or you could say it's revealed that all the liberals are fascist apologists and simps for NATO who will uncritically accept Western narratives about their enemies <laughs> in this uh, sort of new Cold War project that the U.S. State Department and NATO are waging against Russia and China. It's revealed that liberals will stand by the empire to the bitter end. And, you know, as long as somebody from their team somebody from the Democratic Party or the Democratic establishment is telling them something about war, they'll just gobble it up uncritically and then accuse everybody who disagrees with them of being a tanky or being far right without actually engaging with their arguments. That's what I feel like this is revealed more than anything, that if you uh, scratch a liberal, a fascist bleeds. But sure, it's the tankies and the far right allying coming together. I'm coming together with, with Tucker Carlson, you know, because he's slightly skeptical about sending mil billions of dollars in weapons um, to a country that a few years ago, corporate media was calling the most corrupt country on earth um, that has far right neo-Nazi militias running around. You know, because I'm in slight agreement with Tucker Carlson on that issue, that's the tankies and the far right is coming together, being buddy buddy to support evil. And we're just not as smart and not as compassionate as the liberals who want to push Ukrainians um, to their death into the Russian military at, at gunpoint uh, with a gun held by NATO. Um, that's when Soviet tanks entered Hungary. And uh, the question lay before the international left in 1956, do you support the Soviet intervention or not? Those who supported the Soviet intervention were disparagingly called tankies. Now, if you know anything about 1956, and if you know anything about Hungary, you might want to reconsider not supporting the Soviet intervention, because that was one of the most fascistic countries, perhaps had a society more fascistic than Nazi Germany. And so, you know, the whatever socialist project was at work in Hungary in 1956 was being threatened, not by liberalism or democracy, but by fascism. It's a very different situation in 1968 when Soviet tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia. Then uh, it was a question of reform, more liberal reform. It was not fascism. But 1956, a pretty straightforward situation. That term, tanky, those who support the Soviet tanks entering Hungary, 
uh, was resurrected it seems to me just in the last few years and it's a creature of social media i mean i have never in my life actually been called a tanky to my face but i do regularly get called tanky especially on twitter um, this is more a twitter phenomena you know where people have all kinds of try tiktok vijay it's the worst oh thank you for the super chat i will answer that in a sec um Oh, it's just a recommendation. Thank you so much to our friend from New Zealand. Hello, and Kiora from New Zealand, Eddie. Very cool. Or Kiora? How do you pronounce that? I don't know. Keep up the good work educating us, comrade. You bet. Thank you all for being here. I recommend reading Moana Jackson on colonization in Aotearoa. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. I don't know if we've ever had a comrade join the stream from New Zealand, so I really appreciate that. Pseudonyms and... Half the people who seem to call me tanky have accounts that, to my mind, seem like CIA bot accounts. But how am I supposed to know? I haven't read the internal documents from Twitter. I have seen the leaked document from Facebook, which confirms that there's an enormous number of Miami-based uh, troll armies that have been managing accounts regarding Honduras, Cuba, Venezuela, and so on. Yes. I'm glad he brought that up and he's talking about that because I haven't heard many people talk about it. It wasn't published at all in Western media. And in fact, it was scrubbed from Western media. But in Cuba, they were reporting, you know, all these bot accounts stemming from Miami, um, all these different bots just spreading the same kind of propaganda, the same kind of uh, regime change propaganda during SOS Cuba. You know, they helped create a bunch of support for overthrowing the Cuban government here in the West. Um, call anybody a tanky who disagrees. Um, so we know they're doing this bot account thing and, and flooding the Internet with bots. And there's so many people who won't even respond to you, right? They won't even engage with your arguments. They won't even have a conversation with you about Ukraine or acknowledge what you're saying. And any evidence you bring up is Putin propaganda. They will talk to you. Um and, you know, you got to wonder if a lot of these online, these anonymous accounts or these accounts that are just the Ukraine flag um, are bots. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them are. So um, and, and also, I'm glad he's talking about that because we're going to talk about Nicaragua today. And we're going to talk about the way that the U.S. sanctions Nicaragua, um, starves them, forces people to flee, forces people to migrate and try and come to the U.S. when, you know, when a country is being attacked by another country, uh, immigrants all always leave to the attacking country the offensive country that's been a thing historically forever um so people migrate and then the u.s goes oh this is because of socialism this is because of the sandinistas and ortega um so yeah glad he brought that up with the bot accounts we know they're on facebook they must be on twitter and they're the ones who call you a tanky <laughs> Well, also, I also find it uh, just fascinating because it came out in a time when the fact is that the people with the tanks and the guns were actually supporting the coup and those who didn't have the tanks and didn't have the guns were against a coup, specifically against, you know, Evo Morales, but in other places like, you know, the Honduran elections are underway as we as we as we talk right now. And we know that the United States backed a military coup there. We know that the United States has backed, you know, several coup attempts in in places like Venezuela. I mean, you wrote a book about this. And so in, in reality, when they're saying tanky, I would just find it funny because it's like, who has the tanks and who has the bullets? You know, it's definitely not the people who are struggling for, you know, social democracy or struggling for socialism. It's definitely the people in the imperialist core who are, you know, repeating CIA talking points who those talking points are innocent, but they are often betrusted by the barrel of, you know, a tank gun or the barrel of a gun itself. And so I, I always just find that really fascinating. It's the people with no power, so to speak, in terms of military force who are being, who are, you know, being relabeled. It's, as, it's the colonial turn, you know, it's like all of a sudden self-defense. It's the dialectical inversion. That's such a good point by this guy. It is a dialectical inversion. It's the ruling class with the guns and the tanks and the authority pointing towards any revolution that arms themselves and fights back. 
you know, and saying, if you support this, you're a tanky, you just love violence and tanks. Like who's committing the violence in the world? Who's dominating the, the world system right now? Who has the tanks? It's the ruling capitalist class. Uh, looks, you know, like violence or becomes aggression. And then invasion, invasion itself or colonialism becomes a form of self-defense. So I always, I always find that like a, a very bizarre term, but you know. Very good point by that guy. <laughs> and great points by Vijay, of course. Um, so yeah, for those who wanted to know what a tanky means, um, now hopefully you know. Uh, I see some good questions in the chat that I want to answer. Uh, at Midwestern Marks, thank you, Comrade Zerk. It says, some guy in the chat is trying to tell you something with his highlighted messages. I'm not sure if it's coming up for you. I don't know why the Twitch highlighted messages don't come up for me on StreamYard. It's one of the only issues with StreamYard that I have. But hey, how do you get a load of this? I was scrolling on the FYP page on TikTok earlier, and the video from Vice News showed up on my feed about the conflict in Ukraine. That came up on my FYP, too. It must be getting boosted by the algorithm right now. Because, um, yeah, I mean, I follow a lot of news outlets who I completely disagree with on almost everything because it helps me stay up to date with what they're publishing. And it also helps me make videos if I see them make some nonsense, publish some nonsense. And I almost made one last night at like midnight. I was laying in bed and wanted to respond to Vice News, um, but I decided not to. Um, but yeah, it was a terrible, terrible video. Um, just, um, just, you know, blaming the entire conflict on Putin and not talking about the historical context at all. But um, talks about the conflict in Ukraine, how it was taking a toll on Putin, but I shit you not, they legitimately show a clip of a Ukrainian soldier with a patch of the Nordic rune on his arm, a far right extremist symbol. They didn't even try to center it. Craziness. It's crazy how many times that's happened. They can't help it. It's too prevalent in Ukraine right now. The extremists um, who are willing to support extremism and openly support extremism by tattooing it on their body. There's so many of those people that the U.S. is having a hard time hiding the far right extremist um, tendencies of a lot of the political groups they're backing in Ukraine. And hopefully if we have enough time today, we're going to talk about that later, um, about the Azov Battalion and how the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, recently ruled that they're not far right anymore. Um, they're all good. So uh, more on that later. But I really want to answer this. Um, I've talked about Lacerdo's tree so many times. The tree, but it's a diagram of a tree by Domenico Lacerdo that compares Western liberalism to Eastern or Chinese Marxism. Um, it's one of the best graphics uh, that I've ever seen in my life. One of the best explanations of Marxism, um, visual explainers of Marxism I've ever seen. So this says, I messaged you a while back about it. I remember that. Uh, but th you did a TikTok a while ago, maybe the viewers of the link, but it was a tree of Marxism and the roots of the tree was the country's autonomy branches were other things like rights. It made me really consider Marxism as something I can relate to because I felt like an anti-imperialist for a long time. And at the core of anti-imperialism is global South autonomy or autonomy for any, any country being targeted by colonialism. So like Ireland, for example. Um, but yes, I found the tree the other day and I tell y'all what, I literally was like screaming, like jumping for joy when I found this tree, cause I haven't been able to follow, find it in forever. And I literally made it into an emote. So if you follow us, uh, like I'm going to start doing some more lives on TikTok, Um, and you can subscribe to people now on TikTok, and you get emotes for doing that custom emotes. So I made like 15 of them. And I'll have to add them on Twitch, too, for the, the Twitch subscribers. Um, but one of the emotes is the tree. And it says, you just got owned by Lacerdo's tree. So y'all are going to be able to say that in TikTok comments soon, hopefully. Um, if, if that's what the emotes are, I don't really know. But the Western liberal tradition, and this is in um, a larger essay that uh, Lacerdo wrote, um, incredible Italian Marxist, um, Marxist-Leninist tangy, quote unquote. Um, he went to China and wrote a big, long essay about uh, Chinese Marxism and how it's taught to kids, actually. 
Um, so he comes up with this graph uh, midway through his essay. He says, liberation already championed by Marx and Engels as um, a part of the class struggle. Um, find its foundation on thorough reinterpretation of sovereignty as the right to non-interference by other states. Um, so they recognize that national sovereignty, the right to self-determination, the right of a people to determine their own system of governance um, needs to come first. That needs to be the primary principle Marxist support. Because if you're colonized, because if a foreign country dominates your politics um, and your economy, then there's no way to struggle for socialism, right? You're always going to be kept under the boot of imperialism and imperialism will stop the means of production from developing, um, which is largely what pushes the relations of production, the mode of production to change. Uh, developments of the means of production create the possibility for a new social system. Development of the means of production under capitalism creates the possibility for socialism. Um, but a lot of countries are held by... Um, imperialism and colonialism in a feudal state. Um, they aren't able to develop their own industry and their own infrastructure, and thus the relations of production remain stagnant. Um, so the Western liberal uh, tradition, it starts with individual mastery over private property. So these are the roots of the tree. This is what's in the U.S. Constitution. Right to private property, which is protected by the state, protected by the government, protected by the authority of society. Um, if you try and take somebody's private property, if the John Deere workers go into work tomorrow and they try and seize the factory, the police, the state, the police who are an armed body of the state um, are going to come and shut it down and, and give that private property back to the capitalist, back to the owner. Um, liberal society protects private property um, for the individual first and foremost, meaning not personal property, not like your toothbrush, um, but like property that you own that allows you to make more money out of it. So capital. Then it's civil and political rights. So, you know, you have the right to free speech, you have the right to bear arms. Um, and a lot of times because private property are the roots of the tree, um, these political and civil rights are infringed upon when people threaten the right to private property. So like the Black Panthers, um, they were socialists. They were calling for an end to private property and a move towards collective property. Uh, so they were dismantled by the police, killed by the police, thrown in jail on trumped up charges. So they had their civil and political rights infringed upon because they were threatening private property, which the state will always do. They'll always prioritize private property. But in our system, you know, this is what's supposed to be protected. The right to say anything that you want. Um, the right to arm yourself and protect yourself from the government. We know that it's not always true. Um, just look at what's happening with Julian Assange. So uh, Western liberal societies can't even live up to the own ideals that they set out for themselves, but this is what it's supposed to be. And then the top of the tree that grows out of this is identity politics. You know, we can't threaten private property. We can't threaten capitalism. So how do we move the, the system forward? Um, we do it by focusing on identity politics. You know, how do we not, how do we get um, low income black communities, more jobs, money, healthy food, um, infrastructure, that things that help a community thrive, right? We don't care about those things. We care about private property, but, you know, we can um, attack issues of identity politics. Like we can stop uh, people at work from doing microaggressions against black people. Um, all of our solutions fall short of criticizing the system itself, the core of the system, private property, which is the core of the system. Um, so then you just have to target these um, issues of identity politics and fight about them all day long. And that's where you get the polarization between conservatives and liberals who both love um, capitalism at the end of the day. Then you have the Hegelian or Marxist Chinese tradition much, much different. So rather than having private property at the roots, they have sovereignty, including anti-colonial sovereignty at the roots. Like I said, um, understanding that a people deserve the right to uh, um, their own land and to build the society, to build the state, to build the economy that they want. Um, and you can't have the construction of socialism. You can't have the construction of a new social system if a people are under control um, under the dominance of a foreign power, under the control of colonialism and imperialism. Um, so before we even talk about socialism and things like that, 
uh, we need to talk about sovereignty and getting people there. Uh, they're protecting self-determination, which has often infringed upon by capitalism. Next, the trunk of the tree, right to economic well-being. Notice there's nothing about economic well-being in the liberal tree. Nothing about protecting economic well-being. That's not part of the liberal system. Because you can't protect economic well-being while also having private property be the roots of your tree. You can't have a society that's fully based on the private property of individuals, um, capitalist individuals, uh, and also um, enforce economic well-being. That would mean the state or the workers infringing on the rights of private property, saying, hey, we know this property is technically yours, um, but we're going to take part of the surplus that you create and use it to pay for health care and, and things like that. Um, that is what the Western liberal tradition is against, right? We support trickle-down economics. Zero regulation, just let the market do its thing. Um, except for, obviously, the, the liberal state, the imperialist apparatuses of Western capitalist liberal societies are paid for by taxes. And, you know, it is the government acting at the behest of the private property owners. Um, so the idea that liberal societies are anti-big government is a total lie. Uh, but then at the top, then, uh, after... After people's sovereignty has been protected, and you can think about this in terms of China, right? And this is the goals of China um, with their construction of socialism right now. After the sovereignty has been protected, after the country has defended themselves from imperialism and ensured everybody has right to economic well-being. So in China, obviously, they've protected their sovereignty from the U.S. at every turn. And there's various methods of doing that, like the Great Firewall, which stops the U.S. from... Um, uh, infiltrating China via the internet and using bot accounts and things like that that we were talking about earlier, uh, the same way they did in Libya and Syria to foment regime change. So China's protected their people's sovereignty. Next, they protected their people's economic well-being, the poverty alleviation programs, eliminating relative poverty, serving the people, um, protecting their economic interests. So after you've done that, then you can turn to civil, political, cultural, and environmental rights. And this is where, you know, you can find some criticisms of China, right? You could point to like um, areas where maybe there have been, where the state has overstepped their bounds um, or where there's racism present. Um, maybe not, you know, in the party or in the state itself, but in the interpersonal relationships between people, there's places where, you know, um, bigotry exists in China. Uh, it's not like socialism, just abolish bigotry off across the board. So you can criticize these things, um, but you can also look at how China has protected the civil, political, cultural, and environmental rights. And they're doing much better than the U.S., much better. They're transitioning these cities into like zero carbon eco cities. Um, they're like the, the Uyghurs in, um, in Western China, who the U.S., claims China is doing a genocide against, you know, they have their own autonomous zone. That that area of China is called the Uyghur autonomous zone, meaning they have auto autonomy. They have um, control of what goes on in that area, the religion that's practiced, the education. And that doesn't mean they can suppress others. You know, they can't say other people aren't allowed to practice their religion here, but their cultural um, and religious practices are protected and they're protected by the state. Um, so, yeah. Major difference between these two trees. This is just a great explainer. I recommend everybody um, check this out. I need to upload it somewhere so y'all can have it, but um, I'll figure that out. I'll put it in the Discord. Pat Cummings, what's up, Pat? Thank you very much. 20 bucks. Wow. You didn't need to do that. Thank you so much. Last night and the night before, I ate some delicious. Um, some delicious food from your son's hot sauce company. Um, Angry Hornet hot sauce. Oh, I thought I was wearing my uh, my hot sauce hat right now. I, I'm going to go get it. It's worth it. I said Angry Hornet. I meant to say Murder Hornet. I blanked on the name, but. Shout out to Pat's son, the owner of Murder Hornet Hot Sauce. 
the one and only sponsor of Midwestern Marks, uh, who sent us a bunch of hot sauce. And my roommate and I haven't gotten a chance to do another cooking video yet. I told him we got to do one. Um, but so thank you very much for the 20 bucks, though. Really appreciate the support. Not only does dropping bombs on the country hurt their economic well-being, but ever since the U.S. lost the Korean War, the U.S. has done everything they can to keep the DPRK in poverty, mostly by using the embargo, while at the same time, the U.S. does everything they can to boost the economy of South Korea. Eddie Liger-Smith in response to Chauvinist Bausch. Thank you, Jacob. I should put that on Twitter or something. That's a good quote. Um, yeah, I, I forgot I used Lacerdo's tree to debunk Vouch. So if you want a picture of the tree, um, I think you can probably go screen cap it out of that video or this one, honestly. But yeah, I used that tree to explain why we should support the sovereignty and the economic well-being of the DPRK, even though, you know, there are criticisms to be made of, you know, their civil, political and cultural environmental rights, even though they're doing better than the U.S. in reality. Um but yeah, I, that video, that video was more successful in bringing people to Marxism, bringing people to Marxism, Leninism and supporting existing socialism, uh, being a tanky than any other video we've ever done, right? which is why I try and engage with other content creators a little more now. And when there's like drama going down, I kind of try and capitalize on it to bring people to our side um because that video is so successful i had so many people tell me like because vouch didn't always used to be as bad as he was now he was more subtle about his pro nato views um so there were a lot of socialists who got tricked into watching vouch and thinking he was right and by bringing up that tree and just being like vouch is cheering on you know the u.s state department stripping the korean people of their sovereignty and right to economic well-being everything a marxist should be against you know, say what you want about um, the DPRK. The U.S. is doing that. Our country is doing that. Um, a lot of the Vouch fans didn't have anything to say or they had no response to that. And Vouch definitely had no response to that. His response videos were absurd. Um, so those who were open minded, uh, a lot of them changed their mind or at least, you know, came closer to to being a real socialist. <laughs> Thank you so much for rehashing the tree. You bet. I'm definitely going to put that on YouTube as a clip as well, and hopefully TikTok. Um, I was looking for that graphic, and the viewers found your TikTok of it. Am I a tanky on YouTube? Oh, very, very cool. Um, yeah, it's from Domenico Lacerdo. Thank you very much for the 10 bucks, by the way. Left is best. Um, Left is best is awesome. Always supporting the podcast in every way. Um, not the pod, uh, not really a podcast, but supporting the project is what I meant to say. Um, I'm glad you like that tree and no problem for rehashing it. Um, I hope that y'all find that useful. Like I, this is why I was so excited when I found, I was cleaning out the files on my computer and I found the tree. I'm like, let's go. It's Lacerdo's tree. Cause it's hard to find, but like one of the best explainers of Marxism and, and the right to national self-determination you can get. Um, if you want, if you want something that expounds on the idea of national self-determination being the number one principle of communists, um, check out Stalin's Marxism and the national question. Um, this lays out how, why socialists support right to self-determination first, why they should be at the forefront of the anti-colonial struggle, um, the struggle against imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Um, so yeah, I know some people are like scared to read Stalin. I always tell people when they're starting out, like, and a lot of Marxist Leninists tell people when they're starting out, like, try Stalin, read Stalin. Uh, him and Mao or Mao, you know, they simplified a lot of the theories for the working people of their country. But people are just so scared of of Stalin and Mao and, you know, the connotation that's attached to that. They don't really want to start with this, um, even though this would be one of the best books to start with or Foundations of Leninism, um, which I get, you know, which is why I have other books like um, Michael Parenti, or even like Jason Hickel's book, The Divide, I've recommended before, not even a Marxist book, just the book about the 
division of wealth between the global south and the global north and the effect imperialism has had on that um yeah i feel like there are other good intro texts that aren't written by like stalin or mao but if people didn't think so poorly of stalin and mao because of the brainwashing these would be good books to recommend um okay i gotta go to the bathroom now. i've been i've been holding it for 50 years so let me pull up something for everyone to watch while I go. Because I'm not going to leave you with nothing. Um, let's see here. What can we watch? Well, I just found a Vouch video about me. You can watch that. Here, I'll play the Eddie Liger viral TikTok compilation. Oh, shoot. My loud-ass roommates are home. Um, hopefully, y'all don't hear them because of my new mic. All right. Here you go. This is, These are all the viral tic, Not all the viral TikToks, but a lot of the viral TikToks from our account with almost 400,000. So this Giants player stood for with almost 400,000 followers that got banned. So you'll probably see a big difference in my content then versus now. For the national anthem while everyone else was taking a knee, and he said it's because BLM is Marxist. So I went to my college library, which only sells books by Karl Marx because that's what college is, and I want to see if he's right. So let's take a look here. Let's open this up. Uh, Marxism is when you kneel during the specials. Uh, oh my gosh, he was right. What's the next page? Marxism is when you don't think cops should murder black people. Oh my gosh, he was right. You people need to wake up. Look at this. Stalin is the president of BLM. Karl Marx wrote that. Wake up, sheeple. Oh my, Miss Purris is so big and heavy. Hold it right there, man. I'll be taking that. <laughs> What radicalized me? What brought me to the far left? When I was a junior in high school, my dad and I went to Puerto Rico and we built a house for a lady who was living in a shack with an actual tree growing up through the middle of her house. And then when Hurricane Maria hit in 2017, Trump refused to do much of anything for Puerto Rico. And then one of the Trump sycophants, Dinesh D'Souza, tweeted this. Normally, colonies provide resources for the nation that rules them. What does Puerto Rico provide the U.S.? This helped me realize a couple things. One, no matter how many times I go to Puerto Rico and help build houses, the people in power will always keep them poor. There's not enough charity you can do to help these places that are impoverished. And two, the people in power only care about money and they don't care about human life. And this is why I'm okay with like a revolution. Because if you saw someone go and drown a Puerto Rican kid, you would want to destroy that person. But if a person in power allows Puerto Ricans to drown in a hurricane because Puerto Rico doesn't give us enough resources, we don't see that as equally heinous. I'm going to do a part two in a second. Look at this. Communist Vietnam sent the United States 450,000 protective suits for coronavirus. You know, the same Vietnam that the United States invaded, killing upwards of 200,000 civilians. The country that we dropped napalm and Agent Orange on. So what do y'all think? What do you think of the old videos? Are they better now or worse? I feel like we've gotten better. Get a load of this video from the West's favorite defector, Yan Mi Park. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff to talk about today, Jacob, but um, I will throw that in the list of shit to look at at some point. Because um, Yan Mi Park videos are always something else, honestly. Um, all right, let's jump into some of the stuff I wanted to talk about, though. Um, still relevant, the old ones. Good. Thanks. Maybe I'll start re-uploading them at some point. But Let's go here for now. Um, the first thing, well, when I when I looked up, you, I'll always, when I'm planning a stream, I'll always check out the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, whatever mainstream respected outlets there are, um, just to see what it is they're talking about, you know, what the hot button issue in the news is today. And this was the front page of the New York Times. 
I swear to you. I mean, I cropped out some of it. There were like articles over here to the right. Um, but look how many articles. Trump's tax returns were released to the public. Here's what they reveal. Lawmakers published Donald Trump's tax returns amid questions about why the IRS failed to fully audit him. These are key numbers from Donald Trump's tax returns. From 2020, we obtained years of Donald Trump's tax information. It showed tax avoidance. So maybe they just published, you know, they put all of their articles about Trump avoiding um, taxes or Trump's tax returns together so that they were easily accessible for people. But is there nothing more important going on in the world right now? I mean, this should be a story. This should be reported on. But like the transactions, the financial um, actions of all public officials, of all government officials should be public knowledge. Their taxes should be public knowledge. Like you can complain that that's an invasion on their right to privacy, but like too bad. Once you become a public official, right? Once you're a public servant, you, you um, forfeit that right. You forfeit the right to trade stocks and advance yourself financially using your connected position the way that Nancy Pelosi and so many others have. Um, so, but of course the corporate media, the democratic liberal media just attacks Trump, you know, everything that they should be attacking the ruling capitalist class for, they just blame it on Trump and act like Pelosi and Schumer and AOC and all their favorites aren't doing the exact same stuff. Um, and I don't know exactly what was revealed in the tax returns. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't read about it. Um, but, you know, U.S. sanctions and Western sanctions are leading to a cost of living crisis an inflation and cost of living crisis in Europe and in the U.S. Um, as the U.S. has given Ukraine the green light to launch drone strikes into Russia at Russia, um, even though a lot of Western media outlets are still claiming this isn't a U.S. proxy war against Russia, um, which is absurd. But there's so many more important things going on in the world than Trump's tax returns is my point yet this is and Trump has been plastered all over the corporate media since 2016 and hasn't stopped after he lost or got out of office you know for I kept thinking for months after um, Joe Biden won the election like when are these outlets going to stop talking about Trump when are they going to stop having January 6 on the front page every single day and the answer is never. They still haven't. They're still talking about Trump because they know it gets clicks. It gets more clicks than whatever boring politicians, which is not the only reason Trump won, but a huge part of it. Because every time he said something controversial, every time he said something that people thought were going to get him canceled or sink his chances to win, the corporate media would report on it 24-7 and even a lot of times lie about him um, because that's what they do. Um, a lot of stories were truthful. Some were, you know, taken out of context or were lies. And then Trump would go, fake news, fake news, fake news. And American working people were like, yeah, the corporate media is fake news. Woo, I like that guy. And they gave him so much free press, so much free press that it played a vital role in, in him winning the election and eventually becoming the president. I recommend... Studying on authority by Ingalls, if you want to understand it. Yes. Wasn't the Chinese revolution really violent? Yeah, they. it was a revolution. They had to overthrow the, um, there was this feudal, they were a semi-feudal country. They weren't fully capitalist. And there was this class of landlords um, that had ruled for years and years. And by landlords, I mean like feudal lords, like the Dalai Lama in Tibet, who just sat in a mansion and you know, had miles and miles and miles of fields worked by the peasants um, who gave most of what they made to him. They just took what they needed to survive and gave a lot to the Lord or the rest of the Lord. And then they were punished and killed and tortured if they didn't obey um, the commands of the, the feudal lords. Uh, so that's the system that the Chinese revolutionaries overthrew and replaced with a system that abolished illiteracy, brought health care to everyone, abolished relative poverty now, uh, made all these great gains. So, yeah, any revolution is going to be violent because it's the people taking up arms and organizing and struggling against the ruling economic class. Um, but that doesn't mean it's, quote unquote, bad because, you, you know, the results of the Chinese revolution were great for the people. 
Um, but to make that omelet, they had to crack a few eggs. Sorry, I just immediately transitioned from talking about Trump to talking about the Chinese Revolution. That might have been confusing, but um, that was a good question. Chinese Revolution was basically a civil war. No, yeah, I mean there was the there was the revolution um, where they overthrew the Japanese colonizers. It was Japan, right? Um, the Western colonizers, basically. Um, so the Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalists. Um, who wanted a, a Chinese nation, um, first colonized by Portuguese and France and Dutch and finally the British Empire. Um, I don't know who had direct control over China during their anti-colonial revolution. I think, I think it was a combination of like Western countries, like I said, um, and the U.S. would get heavily, heavily involved. But the Kuomintang and the communists were on the same side, the nationalists and the com and Mao and the communists were on the same side trying to overthrow the foreign colonizers. Once they did that, then the civil war started. Then the U.S. said, OK, we like the Kuomintang, the nationalists, more than the communists. We're going to give a bunch of arms and money to them, um, give, you know, encourage them to fight the communists, led to a civil war. The communists won, consolidated support of the people by serving the people and meeting their needs and created China that we have today. I should learn. What about the 1,000 billion that Mao killed? Yeah, I forgot about them, though. <laughs> I should figure out who exactly had colonial control over China before the revolution. Um, I know a lot about China's construction of socialism, about what they've done post-revolution, because that's always what people talk about. I need to learn more about pre-revolutionary China, for sure. Morals aren't objective, yes. Critique of Soviet Economics by Mao. I don't think I've read the whole thing, but that's what I mean by reading the debate within the Chinese Communist Party when they're trying to construct socialism. If you want to see how, you know, um, how they did it and how they do have criticisms of the Soviet Union, right? It's not like every existing socialist country just blindly gives two thumbs up and a 10 out of 10 rating to everything that foreign, or, you know, other socialist countries do. China deeply, deeply studied um, what the Soviet Union did and took it into account, said what works, what didn't, and what needs to be changed for our specific context, um, which is what Mao's critique of Soviet economics did. Che Guevara has a very similar book um, criticizing the Soviet economy under Khrushchev, um, talking about how Cuba's will be different. So is there any merit to mismanagement causing famine? I mean, Mao admitted that there were mistakes, right? They didn't do everything perfect in the process of collectivization. And the famines did happen while they were trying to collectivize agriculture, while they were trying to move towards a new agricultural system. So, you know, it, it's there's an argument to be made that they could have been exacerbated by that. Um, and, you know, basically Mao could have done things differently looking back in hindsight with 2020 vision um you know some things could have been tweaked to be better um but the number of people killed which is nowhere near the number that the the u.s claims mao killed um was created by deng xiaoping in his like political campaigns basically saying you know let's go with my system let's go with more reform and opening up more markets rather than Mao's system. Cause my system would be better. It would, you know, prevent um, this many people from dying. And then the U S and the black book of communism and everyone else took that number from Deng Xiaoping that he was using as an argument against Mao said Mao killed 120 billion people on purpose. And he did it cause he, he hated them. And you know, then he ate their puppies. Um, so, um, Um, so, you know, collectivization affected the number of people who died. Um, Mao's policies, you know, looking back in hindsight, maybe could have been better. Um, but ultimately, those were the last famines that ever happened in China, right? Which is how it usually goes in a socialist country. They collectivize agriculture. They're under sanctions from the U.S. and the West. They don't have any industry. You know, they haven't developed themselves for, for many years. They're in this semi-feudal state. Um, and then, you know, some people die maybe of famine, um, in those early years, but after they industrialize, after they collectivize agriculture, because of Mao's policies, 
no more famines ever again in China. And, you know, now they've gotten to this point where they're an economic superpower uh, who's abolished relative poverty. Um, so, yeah, complex issue. But the way the, the way it's portrayed by Western media and the Western education system makes it more difficult to understand um, the collectivization process and the famines during the Great Leap Forward. Um, all right, let's watch this Richard Medhurst video called The Pentagon is a Black Hole. Do you, do you see it? If you don't know Richard Medhurst, great anti-imperialist journalist who you should all follow. Um, he's constantly a good source for me. Hold on, let me move this over here. Where'd I go? There I am. How they move like snakes. Do you see how they move like snakes? They get the media to whisper in your ear, oh, don't go on strike. No, no, don't strike. Don't strike. It'll cripple the economy. Oh. No, it's 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 not, you know, like giving the army 800 billion to, to fucking bomb, you know, 20 countries. That That's that's OK. That money, we can spare that. But if you go on strike, we're oh, my God, we're going to lose like two billion a day. Well, we can't afford that. You know, you know, the Pentagon has been audited, I think, five times now. And, and every single audit was failed. That means they don't know where the money's going. The, 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 the Pentagon is like a black fucking hole that sucks trillions of dollars. And the, the government, the government doesn't even know where the money's going. I can, I can tell you where it's going. You don't need to audit the Pentagon. I can tell you me, Richard Medhurst. That money is going towards uh, drug deals, towards arms sales, towards arms purchases, towards CIA bu fucking budgets and embassy uh, uh, coffee. That's where that shit is going, man. That shit is going to the spooks. That shit's going to the bombers. That shit's going to the paramilitaries. That's where it's going. I get, there's, there, you don't need to scratch your head. That's where it's going. And apparently that's an acceptable loss. That's an acceptable use of American dollars and taxpayer dollars. But, you know, going on strike, oh, that's too much of an inconvenience. That's the fucking point, man. Great video, as always, from Richard Medhurst um, talking about the Pentagon as a black hole. Um, and I mean, there's no better example of that than the war in Afghanistan, right, which we're finding out more and more about as um, as new things are leaked about it and as investigations into how the U.S. invasion failed so horribly are carried out. There was just massive corruption. You know, they were military higher ups making money off of exporting opium and uh, like 90% of the opium that's used to make heroin in the world is exported out of Afghanistan. So you had the U.S. military with almost no oversight, with almost no regulation, occupying Afghanistan like it's a neo-colony. Um, and you have officials or, or corrupt military officials making tons and tons of profit or private contractors or intelligence operatives, who many of whom are still in Afghanistan. Um, making tons and tons of money off of corruption, off of handouts from the State Department and the Pentagon, off of, you know, creating and harvesting opium, just unseen, obscene levels of corruption. But we can we can increase the military budget every year. And Joe Biden's increased the military budget like four times already. Right. Trump increased the military budget multiple times. And it was one of the first things that they both did when they got in office. And it was approved by almost every single person in Congress. Left, right, center, whatever they call themselves in Congress, they all gave it two thumbs up every time they want to increase the military budget by billions of dollars. You know, but we've got no money for strikes. We've got no money for workers' wages. We can't do anything about inflation. We've got no money for education. We've got no money for low-income neighborhoods. We've got no money to combat the historical legacy of racism in this country, the redlining laws and the you know barring of education for minority groups that's led to more economic hardship in the future. We don't have any money for that kind of stuff. We got more money for the military budget and for the police budgets even though the military budget is a black hole um, of wealth or that funnels wealth directly to the military industrial complex and corporate America. So strangely enough, I was watching a, a Joe Rogan um, clip where he was talking to the guy who plays the Punisher. I don't even know that actor's you name. Th that's right. Oops. Yeah. It's like, if you, 
but they were basically saying the same thing Richard Medhurst was. Not exactly with the Pentagon and that being a black hole, but you'll see what I mean here. I'll just play the video. You get a hundred kids and you thrust them into horrible environments. Very few of them come out to be this, this person who has forged themselves through the fire of adversity. Most people succumb. Unfortunately, I, I think that's right. And I, and, I, and I think most people also don't have I mean, look, I, I, I mean, through all the trouble and all the shit that I got into, I had a loving, supporting family who had my back. And I think that's when I when I think about the inequality in this country. I mean, one, one of the main themes and what I'm trying to do with this podcast is just I've seen firsthand how the legal system, how, how, how so many of the systems that are in place, you know, people who don't have that infrastructure, it is so grossly fucking unfair and, and they I'll... don't have an example to go off of one that's of the right. things about human beings is we imitate our atmosphere that's right. and we become accustomed to seeing people work hard achieve things and people that are kind and ethical and honest and we we look at that as like that's a value that i want to aspire to achieve and if you don't have that around you and all you have around you is crime and drug-ridden streets and gang violence and you don't know any other way to think or behave you don't you don't have an example of it and there's very little effort done to change those neighborhoods i mean if you look at the amount of effort the amount of resources that we pump into other countries we pump into the military we pump into all these various things we always seem to have money for it mm -hmm. imagine if you're a child and you're being raised in this community that it's essentially been the same way for decades that's and right. decades with no help that's right that's it's right. very you feel like an outsider and you feel not you feel like the system is rigged Absolutely. in many ways it is it is i i i, I couldn't agree with that yeah I so everyone can see it everyone can see that the the pentagon is a black hole for money and that we're just funneling all this money all this wealth and value into the military industrial complex into dismantling and destabilizing foreign countries while we have low-income neighborhoods here that are creating a horrific dangerous environment for kids to grow up in for the future of our country to grow up in and it's leading to all these mass shootings you know gang violence drug addiction all these things which are then blamed you know you have racists like ben shapiro who are like it's because of the culture of these, you know, types of people. That's why they're in poverty. Um, you have these racist ideas or people who just shrug their shoulder and shoulders and they're like, that's the way it is. You know, some communities are, you know, ghettos or low income. <clears throat> well, we're funneling billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Over $700 billion a year is what the Pentagon budget is. The military budget is currently. But we know it's it's much, much more than that if you look at all the actual spending funneling so much wealth into that but we can't do anything for these low-income neighborhoods we can't put more social workers and education in these neighborhoods and develop infrastructure we can't do a damn thing for our people in this country you know but when it comes to writing a check for war writing a check for the military industrial complex you know the pocketbook is open Let's break the bank, baby. Our military needs it to protect freedom. Like, we don't even have freedom in this country. You know, what kind of freedom is that when there's this many people living in poverty, this many people being born into horrible environments that are never going to change, in the wealthiest country in the world that's funneling billions of dollars to kill people overseas and protect oil interests overseas? You know, is this the freedom that we're fighting for? Is this the freedom that we're trying to spread to other countries, you know, and, and even these guys, Joe Rogan and um, John Bernthal, whatever, how you, however you pronounce his name, the Punisher, they can see it. Now, Americans have this block in their head where socialism should be, right? So they don't say the answer is socialism. They can say the system's rigged, the system's messed up, and they can talk for 20 minutes, or they could talk forever about why the system's messed up and the ways it's messed up. But the second somebody says, yeah, we should change our system and move to something new. Ah, well, that's socialism. Well, that's communism. That's Marxism. Yeah, that's the only answer. <laughs> Why the hell do you think Joseph McCarthy and the U.S. State Department and the corporations who own the media spend so much time telling you socialism is evil and bad and it could never work and every socialist country who tried to do anything failed miserably? 
They tell you that because they're praying and crossing their fingers every day that people don't realize socialism is the antithesis of capitalism. Socialism is the answer. Socialism is the new system that needs to be birthed out of capitalism where we take all this money and all this wealth and all this labor value that's invested in war, invested in killing people overseas and invested in the people, invested in the masses, use our labor and the value that it creates for us. That is the antithesis of capitalism. Um, but people are able to recognize capitalism is a completely broken, exploitative, oppressive system that's not fair at all, while pretending to be this system based on freedom and equality, um, but they're not able to see what we need to move towards, you know, how we can fix that system. There's a block in their heads where socialism should be, <laughs> unless the Punisher guy is actually a socialist. Have you read The Color of Law? It's an argument that the Jewish segregation is apparent even after the abolition of slavery and extremely convincing. Uh, I have not read that. Thank you very much for the super chat and the um, the book recommendation, Duck Hash Browns. Really appreciate the support um, and the conversation. Uh, I have not seen that, um, but... I would like to the movie, the 13th, which Carlos, cause Carlos and I, when we got our start with socialism, um, we were doing these events called socialist night schools at our school, um, where we, we were basically giving lectures on, on different socialist ideas and talking about capitalism and trying to organize people. Uh, it was highly related to the Bernie campaign because the Bernie campaign then kicked off while we were doing that in 2020. Um, but that was when a lot of the BLM stuff was going down. A lot of people were um, protesting. A lot of people were concerned, especially on college campuses. So we gave a lot of discussions about the military industrial complex. I'm sorry, not the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, um, the racist police system, the quote unquote war on drugs. And we showed this movie, The 13th, one week and then gave a class about it the next week. And this basically says what you're saying that you know slavery and segregation didn't go away the way that it's done was just altered um you know it's less direct less apparent less out in the open because prisoners are the only class of laborer who you don't have to pay a minimum wage other than i guess like um waitresses and stuff um but you don't have to pay prisoners a living wage right you can pay prisoners less than um seven bucks an hour and the average prisoner gets paid like from 20 cents to a dollar an hour depending on what state you're in so what is that if the police are then enforcing this racist war on drugs at the behest of corporations that make up the prison industrial complex who want free labor free labor from someone that's held in a cage for a non-violent offense that sounds like slavery um, which is why the U.S. has more um, prisoners per, per capita than any other country on earth, um, because they're reliant on this labor. They're reliant on this, this free labor. And um, there's a million other ways that corporations make money off the prison industrial complex that they're also reliant on. So like phone calls within the prisons, they're like $10 a call to make. You know, and these are people who, like I said, might be getting paid 20 cents an hour to work. Um, but AT&T and these telecommunications companies, cell phone companies are part of the prison industrial complex. So they're the ones supplying the phones, just like Aramark are the ones supplying the food. And these companies are reliant on that for profit. They're reliant on keeping the prison system going and keeping the prisons filled with bodies to meet their bottom line. And we know that they have to continue growing and growing and growing. Otherwise, they'll go under because that's how capitalism and capitalist accumulation works. So there you go. The revolution won't be televised because it'll start in cell blocks, not the streets. You might be right. Huey P. Newton might agree with you. Huey P. Newton felt that the lumpen proletariat was vital to a revolution in the U.S. There were so many people I talked to during the Bernie campaign. So many people who told me, ah, I would vote for him, but it would sound super embarrassed about it. They wouldn't want to tell me. Um, I remember one guy with a face tattoo who didn't seem, 
I don't know. He looked at me like he was angry for approaching him and asking him, but it was also like I could see in his eyes. Um, people usually didn't just come up to him and say things like that. People didn't usually just come up to him and talk to him in a nice way and ask him what he thinks politically. Um, probably because he has a face tattoo, but he even that guy was like embarrassed to tell me he was a felon. He couldn't vote. There were so many of those people, man. It's crazy that they're not allowed to vote either. Like, People talking about Chomsky still. Has anyone watched Chomsky's debate with Foucault? I don't like Foucault, but Chomsky's lack of understanding of Marxism and the theory of class struggle really comes out in that debate. Um, that's all I'll say. And to the point where I'm watching it, like, this is embarrassing, Noam. Like, you're talking about stuff that you don't understand. Someone says he says just enough to make you think he's a brilliant mind. Yeah. Uh, I like him, though. You know, he says he like I said, he's a pipeline. He's a gateway um, to tankyism. I have a lot of people in the stream right now. He just bumped up to 79 for a while. Dang. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us. If you want to help Midwestern Marks without sending us super chats and super stickers and supporting us on Patreon, which you can do all of that. Um, and we are really appreciative of that. That goes towards making the website better. But if you really want to help us without giving us money, go on to Twitch and create highlights, right? Create clips because um, it'll show me then on Twitch where you where you wanted to create a clip or where you wanted to create a highlight. Um, and that means way less editing for me, right? I can just grab that clip or I can just grab that highlight and put it on YouTube real quick then. So if you want to help out, go on twitch.tv and create some highlights of the Midwestern Marks stream. Because that takes me forever. Truly forever. All right. Which I probably only have time for one or two more stories. But ooh, I don't know which one I want to cover. I have two stories left. Mm, let's do this one. This one's more shocking, I guess. They're both both stories I have pulled up are from the gray zone. Um, so yeah, this is about the Anti Defamation League, also known as the ADL, who recently sent the Gray Zone, great journalistic outlet, um, who always gets smeared for being tankies or conspiracy theorists, because anybody telling the truth is going to be called a conspiracy theorist and a tanky nowadays. Um, but the the Anti-Defamation League responded to the Gray Zone. So I'll say first, Alex, Alex Rubenstein of the Gray Zone um, sent a, um, what's it called, a report. I can't remember what they actually called the report um, that they sent. A hate incident, that's what it's called. Because the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, is supposed to prevent hate and prevent um, hate speech and defamation, um, things like that. Obviously, defamation, that's literally in their name. Um, so Rubenstein sent them um, an incident report and said that the U.S. hosted this uh, sporting event called the Warrior Games, which was hosted at freaking Disney World. <sighs> um, and they honored Ihor Halushka who was a former Azov battalion vet with the Sonnenrad tattoo. So not only was he a member of Azov, this far-right neo-Yatsi militia, but he literally had a far-right tattoo, something, you know, that's almost undeni that is undeniable, right? Because the U.S. and the corporate media can say till they're blue in the face, no, no, Azov isn't, they aren't right-wing anymore. They aren't extremists anymore. Um, but when the Azov Battalion members literally have swastikas and Sonnenrads tattooed on their bodies, kind of hard to deny it, um, which is why that keeps happening. They keep Zelensky and the Ukrainian media keep getting caught, you know, tweeting pictures of people with these far right extremist tattoos um, and then trying to, to cover it up. 
and, and showing their support for those people because it's so prevalent, because there is such a prevalence of people with far right extremist values in Ukraine, like people have been saying forever and like the Western media used to admit in, in 2014. Um, so obviously, you know, this is the U.S. government. This is the Pentagon sponsoring a sporting event at Walt Disney um, where a literal neo-Nazi is being honored. So Rubenstein submits this hate incident to the Anti-Defamation League, and they get a response two weeks later um, where the Anti-Defamation League says that ever since Azov joined the Ukrainian military, they've ceased to be far right. <laughs> so as soon they don't give any evidence of that other than the Ukrainian government said so. Right? We talked to the Ukrainian government, and they said that there was an investigation you know, and once we brought them into the, the actual military, um, they weren't far right anymore. Uh, we don't have any evidence, but just trust us, which is hilarious considering Azov battalion troops and higher ups are still being seen and still being paraded around and applauded by the U.S. when they have neo-Nazi tattoos, far right extremist tattoos. And the ADL is still going to be like, no, no, they don't have any far right members in their their organization anymore. Or I think they admitted in the statement, you know, maybe there are some far right people in their organization, but not a lot. Just the ones who the U.S. parades around Disney World. <laughs> um, so Rubenstein also lays out that that Azov itself has become a magnet, a global magnet for the international far right. Um, and I mean, we had a horrific example of this. Um, in the U.S., where there, one of the recent mass shootings um, was committed by somebody inspired by the Azov Battalion, connected to the Azov Battalion, um, wearing the Azov Battalion's insignia as they were committing this. Um, so there's communication and collaboration between far-right groups internationally, kind of the same way there are for socialists and communists. You know, we know socialists all over the world. Um, but we get together and talk about how to organize workers, how to make workers' lives better. The Azov Battalion um, and far-right internationalism is things like this. You know, how do we do mass shootings and foment chaos um, and do all the things that neo-Nazis do? Um, so this has had effects on the U.S. The, the, you know, of course, there's going to be people inspired by the Azov Battalion in the U.S. when the government's parading them around Disney World, you know, and talking about them as heroes um, and giving them tons and tons and tons and tons of money, you know, to do propaganda, to communicate, to coordinate things, um, to spread their message internationally. So, you know, totally worth something uh, filing a hate incident over and something that you would think the ADL um, would take very seriously, you know, and this would be within their jurisdiction to act upon. Um, but of course, they just say, nope, Azov stopped being far right as soon as they joined the military and because the Ukrainian government said so. And, you know, that's the same Ukrainian government that in 2014 and even 2015, Western media was calling the most corrupt government in the world, you know, before Ukraine became friends of NATO. Um, and they were also talking about the neo-Nazi presence in Ukraine and how dangerous it is and how these groups like the Azov Battalion have come to prominence and how dangerous that is for Ukraine and the international situation um, because of stories like the one we just showed. Um, but as soon as, as soon as the Azov Battalion became the, the favorite militia of NATO, and the Russian invasion kicked off or the U.S. proxy war against Russia and Ukraine kicked off. Um, all of a sudden, the Azov Battalion's not far right anymore. No, they're cool. We got rid of all the far right extremists. You know, this was this giant group that people were constantly joining because they knew it was a neo-Nazi group. Um, but then all the neo-Nazis just up and left. <laughs> and what's so funny is the ADL said that the the group ceased to be um, far right, ceased to be an extremist group in late 2014 when they joined the Ukrainian government. But in 2019, the Anti-Defamation League published an article uh, called Interna The Internationalization of White Supremacy. 
So this is five years after apparently the Azov Battalion kicked all their right-wingers out. And this article from the ADL mentions the Azov Battalion by name 18 times. 18 times they mention the Azov Battalion and label them as a far-right extremist group in this article specifically focusing on how white supremacy has become internationalized, which we were just talking about. So they recognize that this is a not only that Azov was an extremist group, years after apparently they stopped being an extremist group not only do they recognize that but they recognize how this white supremacist ideology that they're based upon has spread itself around the world has become international largely because of the actions of the azov battalion and has created people like the shooter in america who are inspired by them yet when the u.s government is parading azov battalion members around disney world you know, creating great potential for further crimes, further internationalization of white supremacy. You know, they, they have no problem with it. Not only do they have no problem with it, but they'll defend the Azov Battalion and say that they're not a far right group anymore. In 2014, they stopped being a far right group. But wait, in 2019, you said not only are they a far right group, but they're spreading white supremacy around the freaking world. So what changed? What changed is that now NATO and the U.S. State Department and therefore corporate media and the entire ruling class have thrown all of their weight behind this proxy war with Russia, have thrown all of their influence and power into, into trying to turn people against Russia and, you know, support Ukraine. But if, if you support this proxy war, you're not even supporting Ukraine. Because Ukrainians are being pushed towards their death, being pushed in towards the Russian military at gunpoint by NATO. And the media is constantly going, they're willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. They're willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. Well, why don't we ask the Ukrainians about this? But they won't do that. They'll just parade um, Azov fighters around Disney and be like, this, all Ukrainians think like this. You know, They all just want to keep fighting keep going till the last Ukrainian because they want to fight this proxy war for the U.S. Trust us. Wild. One of the most wild stories I've read in a hot minute. Great work there from Alex Rubenstein. Way to submit that incident report and make the Anti-Defamation League admit, admit what they've been doing. Ukrainians, by large, want to fight. Ukrainians were agreeing to a peace deal a while back before Boris Johnson broke it up. Um, and you can't base the prevalence of far-right extremists in 2019 off the, the vote for far-right parties. Um, that's like when the Venezuelan opposition boycotted the election. And then when everybody voted for the ruling class socialist party, um, they pointed at the election results and say, look, nobody voted for the opposition. It's because Maduro is running the elections. Um, there's overwhelming evidence about the Azov Battalion's presence in Ukraine. I mean, how can you say how can you say there's no need to talk about far right extremism in Ukraine when this whole article is about the U.S. military taking a far right neo-Nazi from the Azov Battalion specifically, and parading them around Disney World. Clearly, it's a problem if our government is taking neo-Nazis and bringing them to Disney World and telling Americans to praise them. Um, and what you should really watch, what article you should really watch from someone who's actually in Ukraine. And I have a bunch of buddies who are actually in the Donbass now, like Wyatt Reed and Dan Kovalik. So please check out their work, too. I promise you the neo-Nazi thing is not made up. Um, but watch this. This is from a journalist who... Um, Ramiro, our buddy, talked to a journalist who saw a literal not uh, swastika um, on the wall of Ukrainian government barracks, 
right while he was in ukraine and he tried to like scrape it off the wall but it wouldn't it wouldn't come off because it was painted on there and it had been up there for a while um so there's there's overwhelming evidence of this but since we have someone saying there's no prevalence of far-right extremists in ukraine there's a source to to show you that there are and this one that source i sent specifically focuses on anti-black racism in ukraine because obviously you know these groups are anti-semitic um they're say terrible things about jewish people but they're they're neo-nazis they're far-right extremists they're white supremacists so they hate black people too and this is what you know americans are cheering on right now in ukraine Mm -hmm. so all right i have one more article but i have to get headed to practice unfortunately i practice at four and it takes me half an hour to drive there so thank you very much everyone for watching clip this twitch stream into highlights if you love me if you care about me if you don't want me to spend my whole life editing um please do that um but thank you all for being with us thank you to all the mods thank you to all the super chatters Thank you to anybody who sent videos to react to. If I have enough energy, I'll come back on and, and do another video tonight, um, another stream tonight. Um, but we'll see. I also got to finish up the Journal of American Socialist Studies. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Try not to get your labor value exploited too hard. Much love.